Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the session on digital assets, utility versus security, past, present, and future global regulation. Um, I will be your moderator. My name is Sergu Lee from uh, Tunamu. And it gives me great pleasure to have such uh, distinguished speakers uh, with us today. Uh, from my right, we have Mr. Valentin Schoendienst, uh, Vi Senior Vice President of Axel Springer. <laughs> Mr. Alexander Hopner, CEO of Bose Stuttgart. <laughs> Mr. D.H. Kim, CEO of Finhaven. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Mr. Uh, Alex Kim, CEO of Upbit APEC. Uh, in line with the uh, regulatory recommendations issued by the uh, Financial Action Task Force in June this year, the relevant industries and regulatory authorities have strived to create guidelines. Uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency can be operated on a single global system, and compliance with FAT, FATF's uh, triple rules requires global collaboration. The FATF recommendations and the current trend of the global regu regulatory authorities have common elements, such as anti-money laundering, know your customer, and counterfeiting the financing of, uh, countering the financing of terrorism. However, regulatory implementation may vary from country to country and from region to region. Uh, in Korea, the FATF recommendations are incorporated in a proposed legislation on on the reporting and use of certain financial transactions, which is pending in the National Assembly. There are no clear guidelines on exchanges and ICOs are strictly prohibited in the country. But unlike Korea, approved exchanges are appearing all around the world. Now let me ask the panelists to share their views on the regulatory environments regarding digital assets, utility tokens, and security tokens in their respective fields. Uh, first, we will listen to the presentation from Mr. Alexander Hopner, Mr. D.H. Kim, and Mr. Alex Kim, in that order, and then we will have a free discussion on them. And please be reminded that if you have any questions on the presentation of the panelists, you can post them on the UDC 2019 on-site web. And with that, let me first introduce Mr. Alexander Hopner, CEO of Bose Stuttgart. Bosse Stuttgart is a security exchange which is regarded as a pioneer in Germany's digital, digital asset transaction market. Uh, using its Bison application, the company has successfully launched the cryptocurrency exchange that also offers custody services. Mr. Hoffner's area of responsibilities include the primary markets, marketing, communication, and digitalization. Ladies and gentlemen, please give me a uh, give Mr. Hopner a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Currently, I don't. Thank you. Something. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Not as work. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to to speak here. Um, yeah. We at Börse Stuttgart. We are very convinced that what we have in front of us is a major change and development in the whole finance industry. And uh, it's our strong belief that you can either be part of that movement or you will more or less be bypassed by the ones who go into that field. So for us, it was a decision even made in 2017 that Börse Stuttgart will transform totally <coughs> into a digital exchange offering tokenized services and tokenized assets for trading for their market participants and investors. In that sense, or having said that, our view is that if you want to offer that as a service, then you need to offer the full service value chain. Otherwise, uh, customers cannot really, um, you cannot be helpful to customers in any sense. So we are going to offer a tokenization platform where clients can come and tokenize their assets, be that securities or non-securities, so issue their ideas and their financing needs in a tokenized way, list these on a regulated exchange 
offering trading for retail and institutional clients and naturally also safe custody. For us, especially safe custody and serving retail and institutional clients is very important because that is something which at least the major players in the finance industry as of now have really difficulties in tapping into that market. So for us, it really makes sense to offer that as a full service and be a market participant there. We had a lot of discussions actually in Germany when I was approached by, especially by the real economy saying, hey, if that blockchain stuff is going to work out, actually, we don't need your exchanges anymore. Well, we naturally have a little bit of a different view to that one, at least for the time being, because when everybody is out there talking about ecosystems, and about what they want to do with the ideas of tokenized assets. From a regulatory standpoint, they're talking about a marketplace. And here we come to a very important point and something that I always like to point out when I'm sitting on a panel or having discussions around this. Regulators are not regulating technology, they're regulating function. And if you change the technology and the function stays the same, regulation stays the same. And this is absolutely vital. So even yesterday when we had discussions here or heard panels or discussions, it was somewhat solving issues of the future, issues of non-permissioned and public chains or environments, DLTs. But you have to learn to walk until you can run. And today regulators will start off the race into blockchain technology for all assets with private environments and with permission environments. And allow me to say so, we don't have an issue in domestic trading of uh, securities uh, at an ultra low latency with knowing who our clients are, with knowing who our customers are, with having perfect data on everything. This is not a problem of today. The problem of today is very inefficient, very costly post-trade. We're all talking about the global financial market, but if you look really into it, it's not a global financial market. It's a really fragmented regional market, and it's very expensive <coughs> for users of that market to overcome come these hurdles. Now, if you allow me to very simplify it, to say how is, how is the process running right now from an investor uh, to the issue on the other way around, then you have these various roles that are in this circle that have to be fulfilled from a regulatory basis. So it is not as easy as it always sounds that I just go somewhere and buy a stock or buy, buy an asset. There's a lot of roles involved because at least in most jurisdictions, you're not allowed directly as a, as a trader to trade or as an investor to trade securities. So there's a lot of steps that you have to do. If you look, what more or less happens is that DLT allows us because of the inherent capabilities to fulfill a lot of the functions that beforehand certain market participants took over, they can be now substituted by the technology. And this is the big breakthrough for us. So we can actually push the players outside of that circle, but the function remains. And that means that it is absolutely vital to understand <laughs> that although technically you can substitute a player, a role, a certain aspect of the value chain, the function remains. And the regulator will, let's say, double check on you based on the function that you fulfill. And this is extremely difficult for a lot of European startups and, and development companies because they come with this pure technological drive and, and really the, the, the push directly into the ultimate solution that will probably come, but that's not a starting point. And uh, we had discussions here in, or in Zug, for example, where one of these, these companies said, hey, regulator, you have to understand we're public. And, and my answer was, no, the regulator doesn't understand and he ha doesn't have to understand. He will say, I don't care, go to jail. Yeah? And this is something where really we need to bring both worlds together. Ultimately, even our goal is a non-permission public environment, but we need to take the regulator and the legislation along on that path Otherwise, we'll fail because we're, we're stepping too fast and we are in a highly regulated environment. But it is our strong belief that this is achievable. This is why we are, I, I cannot remember having been in a time where the change in the whole industry is as big as it potentially can be. Maybe with the introduction of uh, technical trading, which was like mid of the 90s, 
we had the same, let's say, speed of development and, and news coming around there. So for us, it's really the first step is expanding naturally Germany and in Europe. Germany is really trying to be on the forefront of regulation there and be really at least once, I would say. Um, we missed a lot of stuff, um, which you, especially in Korea, but also in Asia, very well on the forefront. But for regulating of security tokens, uh, Germany tries to be on the forefront, at least in Europe, uh, with the strong push to have something set uh, until latest mid of next year. We'll see whether that works out, but at least that's the, that's the will of, of the government. And they have also the strong will and belief that they need to also bring up an environment, a safe and sound environment, for uh, non-permission in public blockchains. And this is very interesting, because regulation so far taps on the one single person or entity or function that they can make responsible for, which, as we all know, is in a public side pretty difficult. But nevertheless, they want to tackle that one. And we, as Börse Stuttgart, we decided to be on the forefront of the exchanges. Uh, we have everything in place that we need for that one. Plus, we are the only exchange globally who owns a broker, which is very important when you want to offer uh, trading for, for retail clients. Again, technically is one thing. The function to offer that to retail clients, again, taps into a regulation standpoint. We try this naturally over a partner network. We're running eight exchanges, nine exchanges in Europe, or nine exchanges including Switzerland. We're running the largest OTC network in, in Europe, although probably most of you will never have heard about us. Um, and we partnered up with a very, very strong brand, Valentin will talk uh, about it a little later, Axel Springer, to have a mass market adoption reach. Because our race is not, sorry to say so, to have the be best technology in the world, our race is to make what you do mass market adoptable. Because we strongly believe in the end, it cannot be just a thousand or a couple of thousand people doing the trading here and doing peer-to-peer -peer trading. We need to evolve this whole technology in a sense that major players of trading of assets can use that within their normal day-to-day -day life. And so we need to bring the efficiency there, and that means it needs to be faster or it needs to be cheaper, more efficient to trade, or on a global basis. And this is the next push that's going to come. How do we link up the regions that are going to evolve there on the blockchain environment and, um, and on the blockchain, let's say, ecosystem or space. As said, we have everything in place. Uh, started with our trading app starting this year. It's up and running. Custodian's up and running now. Uh, the fully-fledged MTF will follow shortly, and the custodian will be um, set to the next rule set as soon as the German law has been passed. The German regulator just announced how this is going to be organized and we'll then switch uh, the organization of uh, the current custodian to the new regulatory regime, and then we will, by roughly, let's say, starting next year, end of this year, we'll be in the position to offer that also on a European basis. I'll jump over that one. Um, yeah, as I said, I think what is very important, especially for a developers company, uh, conference, technically a lot of things are possible. But the regulator does not regulate technology. This is very important. That regulates the function. And although we can kick off and kick out a lot of classical players, and we have the chance without legacy IT systems to, to build this new, we still have to adhere that the regulation kicks in as soon as we take up that role. So please bear that in mind when you're uh, charging or hitting or hunting the next technology steps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, it's very interesting to hear from you that uh, uh, there are uh, pretty good justifications for, for taking the traditional stock ex exchange model to, to a digitalized version. And uh, I'm, I'm really kind of surprised, I think everybody in the audience, that Germany is leading the, the path in that regard. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, moving on to our next speaker, Mr. D.H. Kim. Ah, yeah, sorry. sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon. 안녕하세요. Kim Do Uh you know, I'm going to talk about relevance. Actually, it is uh, in line with uh, uh, what Alex just talked about. Uh, so today I try to just focus how I can help uh, deliver a certain kind of framework of capital markets, uh, you know, for developers to... 
uh, kind of brainstorm your ideas in terms of uh, you know, architecture uh, or you know, you know, the, the blockchain enthusiasts, uh, you know, how you can figure out uh, something that's really applicable for, um, to capital markets. Uh, I'm going to start with what is Finhaven. So my company, Finhaven, uh, we have Finhaven Technology and Finhaven Capital. And um, you know, also in terms of product, we have Finhaven Trading and Finhaven Club. So Finhaven Trading is basically uh, it's a, a trading platform uh, to uh, trade securities. Uh, but in this case, the securities, we call them digital securities instead of security tokens, because tokens sometimes can be um, ambiguous. Uh, in terms of what you really mean by that. Uh, Finhaven Club is a marketplace for research and data. So you can pr publish your research or data, and you can price it, and you can trade them um, you know, on, on, on the platform. We just actually re had a release one of Finhaven Club yesterday. So at Finhaven, we build the capital market infrastructure. When you say capital market infrastructure, uh, structure, we say end-to-end -end capital market infrastructure. So the beginning part is really about investor onboarding all the way down to depository. Of course, in the middle, uh, you need an underwriter, uh, you, need to, you need an issuer, and the issuers issue their securities, and you know, broker-dealer, they trade, and uh, there is a stock exchange, clearing agency, transfer agent, and some technical service providers in the middle, and the depository. So we provide, try to provide the full infrastructure to capital markets. What we do is parallel innovation, and this is, uh, I think it's quite relevant to uh, probably all of you, because um, you know, when we look at capital market uh, legacy system, it's based on paper securities. But we are talking about digital securities. When you have a different assumption in this case, uh, which is uh, digital securities, then uh, you probably have to think about whether the legacy system is really meaningful or is it really applicable to digital, to the world of digital securities. So we take the approach of uh, let's recognize, so recognizing the legacy system and parallel by parallel, we, we develop a separate uh, infrastructure for digital securities. Now, what I just said is really about relevance. Well, relevance is always an interesting topic because you know, we can talk about a lot of stuff, but if it is not relevant to a certain thing that we are working on, in this case, business, capital market business, then the technology itself is meaning, meaningless. So to, be, to, to make something meaningful, we gotta think about the relevance. And in this case, relevance to the capital markets then what kind of framework do we need for capital markets? Now let's go back. What is the simplest transaction you can think of? So this is the elders at the gate. So, you know, like thousands of years ago, uh, you know, elders gather at the gate and they sit down and they talk. So, you know, you wanna buy a, a, a chunk of land from, uh, you know, for, from your relative. Now, you need some witnesses. So you go out to the street and you call the others and you know, I, I say, you know, I wanna buy this you know, uh, uh, lot of land from, uh, from Bob. So elders, listen, Bob, how much, you wanna, how much do you want? What's the fair price to you? And he would usually say, you know, we're, we're good friends. I don't really need money, just take it. But of course, he doesn't really mean it. So he say, well, just give me a you know, thousand, I don't know, a thousand bushels of grain. Okay, good, so here's the deal. And then elders see, elders, did you just, you know, you just heard, right? I, I'm, I'm buying this land from him and I'm going to pay a thousand bushels of grain. So that was the deal. So here's a buyer and seller, right? Who are the custodians? Buyer is the custodian, seller is the custodian. They are basically, if you own the asset, you are the custodian. Is there a counterparty transaction issue? Counterparty risk? Yes, there is. Why? Because, well, later on, when he, I don't know whether he's going to pay me, really, right? So sometimes they deliver, well, here's my sandal, take it. So this, and then, well, here are the witnesses. But simply, at later stage, if there is any kind of title paper, they probably exchange uh, money with a title paper. In this case, a thousand bushels of grain with a title paper. So let's think about this original, the simplest transaction model, 
and how we can secure this model in, with these modern technologies. Next, this is May 17, 1792, I believe. Uh, this is the um, <coughs> beginning of New York Stock Exchange, a buttonwood agreement under a buttonwood tree. Well, some people say there was no buttonwood tree, but you can, you can see the stockbrokers, they gather, they say, you know, we got to have a certain agreement so that uh, the market can be, uh, you know, stable, right? And there is efficiency in capital markets. But again, if you look at London Stock Exchange, I'll just read to you in London Stock Exchange history what I found. 1972, the London Stock Exchange and Axtel introduced the market price dis display service with the 16 pages of market prices and four pages of company news summaries. The services mainframe uh, computer took up an entire floor of a city office building. That's 1972. 1986, so this is not that long ago, 1986, Big Bang, the deregulation, the deregulation of the securities industry as trading moved from face-to-face -face dealings on the market floor to computer and telephone dealings, a new method of distributing information fairly and widely was required. The exchange enabled market users to view full text announcements on the company news service and the summaries on the added text news service. That's 1986, okay? Now, let's think about this. Advance of information technology. Does it really help to have efficient capital markets? Probably. We probably have uh, better liquidity with all these computer databases, right? Because we don't have to go out to wave our paper securities. Here's my paper. Here's the uh, you know, commercial paper. Please buy, buy, buy. By the way, that's Mr. Goldman of Goldman Sachs, the founder of Goldman Sachs. That's what he did in Manhattan, waving commercial paper to sell commercial paper to people. Now, but then again, with a computerized database is what you have. We have all different kinds of risk issues. So we have a new risk profile. We constantly got to measure and mitigate. Let me tell you a couple of them. We have a custodian risk. So what is a custodian risk? When you have an account with a Samsung Securities, for example, you are the owner of those securities. So you own, let's say, 1,000 shares of POSCO in your account of Samsung Securities. And of course, you are the owner of the securities, but who's the custodian? Samsung Securities, okay? But you remember, was it last year? Um, they made a mistake by putting wrong number on the dividends, right? It was a cash dividend, but they made it a stock dividend. And then all of a sudden, number of shares outstanding increased. Well, who knows? Even now. A lot of companies, they probably have more, uh, you know, uh, number of shares that we, uh, that we really see on the paper. With a custodian, you, as, since you're not a custodian, when broker dealers, they lend your securities to short sellers, do they need a permission from you? No, they don't need your approval. But they can lend your shares to other people, right? And then we have a short seller issue in the market. What's the next issue? Counterparty risk, right? Because now you're using a, using a custodian and there is usually transaction plus two. In fact, in Japan, uh, even up to uh, June this year, it was transaction plus three days. Now I think there are two. But even with that, you basically rely on the credibility of broker dealers. So that's why there's a capital adequacy requirement of broker dealers. Okay. One more, what about information? I just read to you what happened with the London Stock Exchange, right? So what if a company's issue misleading information? Right? What if there is a bunch of a conflict of interest that they hide and they don't disclose to the market? So there is an information issue too. So that's information asymmetry. And that's why we have regulators. And the regulators, they have two things in their mind. One is protecting investors. And the other is promoting fair and efficient capital markets. Right? So when you think about the technologies, 
they, these are the principles, you know, how uh, the mindset of regulators. Uh, regulatory requirements of uh, marketplaces. So today we're talking about marketplaces. Uh, whether it's a security market or utility market, basically these are uh, the main regulatory requirements you have to consider. Right. Their letters are quite fine, so I don't know, I can really read them. <laughs> you can see market integrity, conflict of interest, transparency of operations. Uh, a lot of things when you look at, basically they want to make sure, uh, you know, there's a fairness in the market and there's integrity in the market. And if you use outsourced uh, service providers, you've got to make sure you check on them and you clearly know even their books and records. Right? Regulatory requirements of dealers. Why did I include this page here? Just Alex mentioned, what did he, what did he say? He says he has broke a dealer so that he can have retail clients. Now we see a potentially uh, a, a potential uh, integration, vertical integration in capital markets with the new technologies. So you also have to consider regulatory requirements of dealers. Uh, one, it's, you know, uh, uh, an important element that I put here is custody. With all these regulations, now let's think about this. What about high frequency trading? What about short selling? What about system integration? Complicated databases and complicated cross-border transactions and expensive cross-border transactions. When I say expensive, it's not just a money issue, it's also a time issue too. Transparency issue, KYC, AML, suitability advice. Although there are all kinds of regulations, are they really real? For example, do you feel your investment advisors really know you? Have you ever received any suitability advice? Or have you just signed on the product uh, agreements, not really reading the fine prints? You probably heard the story of DLS nowadays in Korean market, incomplete sales, branjan panme, right? Why? Because people, do really, you know, people don't read those stuff. And in fact, banks, when they ask you to sign, they don't want you to read them, I believe. <laughs> That's why there are five letters. <laughs> so whatever, you know, there are regulations, but I'm not really sure whether they are real. But what am I saying? In fact, with the technologies, I think they can become real. That's the possibility. And I, that's the hope that developers can deliver. Uh, the, you know, that's a potential value that uh, developers can deliver to capital markets. Now, let's go back to all this blockchain hype. But well, specifically speaking, it's a cryptocurrency hype or token hype. Why were you excited? Because you have anonymous wallet? Yes, that's one aspect. But anonymous wallet has custodianship and liquidity. And all of a sudden, now you see tokens and cryptocurrencies moving across the borders, right? And you, a lot of you probably travel to Singapore and you saw all kinds of nationalities, young, smart guys gathered together talking about all these cryptocurrency and tokens. And that definitely show us the future. Well, there is a possibility of global capital market integration. So then, with this technology, what is the key? I started with the uh, old story, custodianship. So now, you don't have to, you may not have to, I'm not saying you don't have to, you may not have to give your custodianship to a broker dealer to create liquidity. The current system is you are supposed to get this share certificate and deposit that share certificate with a broker dealer to have liquidity. In other words, to sell your shares or to buy new shares. But you may not have to do that. Why? Because there is a digital wallet in which you kept your digital securities and you can create liquidity from your own wallet. And if, with that, we may prevent a lot of uh, negative issues of short selling as well. What about clearance and settlement? 
we, uh, we talk about clearance settlement, but sometimes we're not really that clear about clearance. Okay? So you're the custodian, here's another custodian, right? Securities are moving, and the other side, cash is moving too. Then do we need a clearance? Is there a clearing process? That's a question to ask. Now, what about compliance issues? All the issues that related to regulations, not all, but most of them are involved with the compliance. But as I said, are they really real? In other words, do we really have a good compliance? You'll probably heard, you know, if you give 10% of fee, you can do the money laundering. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we hear, you know, some of the big investments got involved with those transactions. Uh, I don't know. I, I just read articles on newspaper, so don't rely on me. But, you know, there is some stories on, news, on newspaper. So with this, we probably have a much better compliance, right? And the, the compliance can be a, a preventive solution rather than you try to fix something after a, digest, a, 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 after a digester. So, uh, we can build a certain new infrastructure, a parallel innovation, and then when this new infrastructure in a contingent environment, when it is successful, we can probably build a bridge from the legacy system, and step by step, we can move from the legacy to the new system when we have very good technical platform. Uh, and, and these are the two key principles of innovative wallets. Essentially, uh, the platform of capital markets are mostly about wallets. And the innovative wallets, one is custody side, that's really about security issue, and also conceptual issue too uh, with the technology. And after all, the winner is someone who can create liquidity. So it's a security and liquidity, these are the two key pillars of capital markets. So destination of innovation, well, efficiency. It's got to be simplified, more transparent, to lower transaction costs, time and money, better capital allocation, and cheaper and better compliance. And with that, we probably can have pretty good global capital market integration, just as we, as we have pretty good uh, commodity market in global marketplaces. Thank you. Uh, by the way, we're you know, looking for uh, uh, strong Rust developers and uh, blockchain architects. So if you are interested in working with Finhaven, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much, DH. Um, and that was a very insightful uh, walk down history, uh, th going back thousands of years into the history of uh, securities markets. And I, I just wanted to say that uh, I have the utmost respect for, for our banks that uh, they, they uh, uh, I believe they, they intend for their customers to read all the fine print. So <laughs> just wanted to, to say that. Okay, uh, and then we have uh, Mr. Alex Kim. Um, I have had the privilege of working together with Mr. Kim at, in Neva and also Kakao. And uh, he's, uh, he, he and I actually joined around the same time uh, Tunamo together and he's in charge of uh, uh, Southeast Asian uh, uh, operations. So with that, Mr. Kim. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the uh, great intro, uh, Mr. Lee. So my name is Alex. Um, I'm heading a bit at Sea Pacific. Uh, we have a business in uh, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand at the moment. Uh, let me briefly like intro you uh, how is the, um, the, the regulation stands in uh, those countries. So in 2017, when we started a bit overseas like expansion initiative, there wasn't much regulation on crypto space. So all the central bank, they said that, okay, you can buy BTC, you can sell BTC, you can hold BTC, but it's not regulated. So be careful when you do it. And um, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, they said, oh, but BTC cannot be used as a means of payment because it's not legal tender here. So that's what they said. But in uh, Singapore, they had a, a little bit like more lenient approach, saying that like whether using PTC or not as a means of payment should be a commercial decision. You just decide if you want. Um, but we, they said that um, in Singapore, they saw some growing interest on ICO scene. So 
they uh, clearly stated that if you want to do ICO, you should avoid this, 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 and do your KYC. So that was the status of the 2017. And after two, uh, from 2017 to 2019, we saw a lot of action on government side to um, bring some um, the crypto regime in uh, this space to minimize the, the side effect and promote those innovation. They can uh, hopefully uh, benefit from that. So they started with the, the, their philosophy. Some believe that we have to ban it. Or some might say that, oh, this could be chance. Some can see this is a threat. Or somebody can say that, I don't know wh where it goes, just, but uh, let me just look and see. And then they define their status. What is crypto? Some say uh, it's commodity. Some say uh, it looks like security. Some says, I don't know yet. I don't want to define it yet. And then they study what is applicable regulations and who should be the right authority to monitor this space. And after that, of course, they need to amend the regulation they have already, or they need to define more um, the detailed like guideline for intact implications. And during the process, regulators, they realize that they need to talk with other regulators as well, central bank, securities commission, and tax authority, and this and that. And they also know that they need to talk a lot with the crypto players uh, like us. So we are actively engaged in those discussions. And also they seek opinion of those professional law firms or accounting firms and this and that. So I will say that uh, this is consensus building process because this is moving. We don't know where it goes. So they need to talk a lot with those related parties. And when I look into that approach, uh, I realized that they got those key four um, the, um, the, the, the target to achieve, uh, which is that they want to bring the market integrity so that no one is like doing um, the um, stupid stuff inside. And they want to prevent those money laundering, like stop this um, terrorism financing thing. And they want to protect investors. And they want to bring something good for that, for that country. So to achieve those target, uh, they have uh, some requirement uh, for those crypto players, starting with the uh, fit and properness, you should be the right person to run this business. And then they have uh, some financial like requirement, you need to maintain this amount of capital, the, the thing and debt and the uh, equity ratio and this and that. And they ask you to be ready in operation. They ask a lot of things, like you need to um, keep certain uh, percentage of cold wallet and you need to assign some portion of your, your, your crypto holding to third party custodian. And if there's no like such a thing as a digital asset custodian, they define one. And then um, they, uh, they make a clear guideline how to report if something bad happens. So uh, that meaning the reporting obligations. And um, each country has different idea, but um, they try to define those players in those scene. Um, let's say they define issuer and advisors like financial advisor in uh, the, the traditional securities. And then they define digital asset dealer and broker and they define um, secondary market like a bit, and they define this as a custodians. So with like this approach is not as well defined like this as it's seen. It was bumpy road here and there, but I feel like they are mostly like following this, the thinking to bring uh, more transparency in this innovative uh, field. So they were very busy. Uh, in last two years, MAS of Singapore, the uh, financial authority there, they issued a payment service bill. They, um, they revised it a lot uh, after a few consultations, and they uh, revised ICO guidelines as well three times. So they now have a quite um, complete and clear guideline at the moment. In Indonesia, um, they uh, defined who should be the right authority to monitor this space. So um, in 2018, uh, June, they uh, defined crypto asset as a commodity. So uh, the BAPETI, which is a commodity and futures trading um, the regulatory agency, became the, the authority to monitor this space. And then uh, after a few months later, they uh, issued a guideline uh, for crypto um, the, 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 the regulation. So in Indonesia, if you want to be um, the operating uh, secondary market for crypto, the asset, like utility exchange, you need to get licensed. In Malaysia, um, they issued a regulation from BNM, the Central Bank of Malaysia. After that, they changed it authority to SC, and SC announced um, the regulation. 
now they have um, those uh, resigned to issue a license to those exchanges in Malaysia. Um, Thailand, um, they had an emergency decree by King, which is signed by King of the Thailand, uh, because a lot of people like do something with the crypto, but there was any law in Thai, so um, they uh, issued a decree saying that they're going to be a regulation soon. And then they issued the crypto regulation at 2000 uh, July, I think. Then after that, um, now they are issuing those licenses to like proper exchanges in Thailand. In the Philippines, they were quite early. So I think they um, issued the, the regulation at 2017 January because they have a lot of cross-border remittance. Um, and now they have uh, at least nine licensed exchanges in, in Philippines. So those countries, those governments, they were very busy in the last two years. They tried very hard to bring those the crypto uh, the resign in those countries. So let me go to this country one by one. So this is a speech by head of MAS of Singapore. It was announced uh, last year, March, in Money 2020 um, event. Uh, I think this speech can is like capturing those idea behind those um, regulation quite well. So they say the money has been used like since 5,000 years ago, but the money we think at the moment, which is like backed by those central bank, is quite recent development. It has been only like 300 years like until now. So they keep their stance that with technology, we don't know where it goes. Crypto asset can be money, we never know. So they want to make it, they want to like open, they want to be like open to the possibilities. So they decided not to uh, regulate crypto itself direct. So there isn't any crypto related regulation specifically in Singapore. Instead, uh, they try to uh, minimize those side effects, including those um, KYC ML issues. Um, but still, they say that we do not strive for innovation. So it's like a wait and see approach. And um, to comply uh, with uh, wha what they said, um, they had a clear guidance on ICO. So they noticed that a lot of people come to Singapore to do um, token issuing. So in 2017, November, they issued a guideline. You should, if you want to do ICO, you should do this, this, this. It was only like 13 pages long guideline. And after that, people noticed that, oh, so like people see this as uh, Singapore legalizing ICO. And it gave uh, the project a lot of the peace of mind because they don't, uh, they, they, since they know like what is not allowed to do, uh, they don't fall into a trap of regulation, right? So there a lot of people come to Singapore. And MAS had to, um, to, re to revise the guideline a little bit more. So they added um, like 10 pages more. <laughs> so there was a second <coughs> revision. So this clarity is helping um, Singapore a lot to make it the, the, the destination for ICO. So if you look at the, the guideline, uh, the overall stance is that as long as you don't do this, 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 we don't regulate it. So that is uh, the overall stance of it. And But they say still, if you have entity in Singapore, you have a general obligation of KYC ML. So you should do this, this, this. Do your KYC properly. And they also have uh, some clouds about those exchanges saying that, oh, we are working on um, Payment Service Act. We're going to do something on crypto exchange in that bill. So please consult your law firm in Singapore. So that's what they say. And they even have a case studies because so many people ask MAS, oh, can I do a token issue in Singapore? So they have like six case studies at the initial the, the, the guidelines. So they say, case one, case two, case three, if you do this, 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 don't ask, it's not regulated. So it's like on your own. And this case six is quite interesting because it talk about um, the crypto asset exchange and they say that SFA is not um, the, the, the applied on this um, activities. But soon uh, we're gonna regulate this space uh, with the the payment, new payment framework. So like, the, the, you need to watch this space. That's what they say. So with this, Singapore become the ICO destination. And we see that there is like huge competition in uh, ICO scene or IEO scene. So uh, I believe that finding right jurisdiction to start your the um, token project is like becoming more and more important. In that sense, I would say Singapore could be the prime location. If you're a big company, you want to issue a token like reverse one, 
to use um, to le to leverage your existing business. You don't want to go to, I would say, um, some the unclear places. So in that sense, uh, Singapore could be a popular place thanks to their clear guidance. So if you look at the 2018, Singapore became the top country in the world by ICO funds. And now, they had a long history with the Payment Service Act. This act is basically defining those fintech space. They, they had a lot of revisions and consultations with the businesses. And the core idea of this is that they don't really define business itself. As Alexander mentioned, they focus on function. So MAS, they slice and dice existing fintech companies and they define key elements or activities of those services. So they divide into uh, seven activities. So they say, if you're doing fintech, you will be either like issue accountant or you are maybe transfer money domestic or you're gonna be like cross-border remittance or you may like handle those digital payment tokens and this and that. So if you are doing business and among your function, if you do one or like more than uh, those activities, then you need to get license or permit by activities. It's like a Lego block. If you do FinTech, but if you are not doing anything, any activities defined in here, then you don't need to ask MAS. And thi in this activity, um, they have activity F, I think, which is the payment um, token services. So they generally describe crypto asset as one of the digital payment token. So with this, they don't really directly um, regulate crypto space. But they do have clear guidance what you have to do when you do those activities. And it includes like quite tight KYC ML procedures, so those information securities, uh, TRM thing, and PCPs and everything. So this is uh, how they do it in, in Singapore. And let me talk about Indonesia uh, like it, uh, now. So in Indonesia, they got uh, some different idea. So uh, this is an article um, in, in Indonesia and uh, the Jokowi, the, um, the current president of Indonesia, he mentioned that we have to catch up and blockchain or DLT or Bitcoin is another thing we have to catch up. If not, we're gonna be left behind. So they see this thing as a new technology where they have to catch up to make some difference. And Indonesia, um, they have, they don't have like really big advanced financial market, but they are big in commodity. They have a palm oil, they have a coal, they have the biggest gold mine in the world. So all those like instrument was evolved around commodities. So in Indonesia, all those like options or futures based on commodities or securities are commodities. So in that sense, they say Bitcoin or crypto asset is intangible thing. So they think PTC is a commodity. Hence, the BAPEPTI, which is a um, commodity futures trading uh, regulated agency, becomes the authority to monitor this space. And they did announce a long regulation and they define crypto asset exchanger, crypto asset clearinghouse, crypto asset um, the, the digital asset custodian and this and that. And they do have detailed guidelines what you have to do. You need to um, pass, you need to get uh, this amount of people, you need to get um, the, uh, what is that, the ISO information security uh, certification to make sure that you don't have any hacking accident. Uh, you need to uh, keep some uh, capital amount. If you want to open up the uh, crypto exchange in Indonesia, the minimum capital requirement is about $3.6 million, it's not small. Mm -hmm. So they have a quite detailed guideline. And any crypto asset, which is traded in Indonesia exchange should be uh, approved by them. So um, those regulators in Indonesia, they will decide which token can be traded or not. Malaysia uh, is quite an interesting thing. So um, the, in Malaysia, BNM used to be um, the, 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 the body to control this space, but um, suddenly become SC, the Securities Commission becomes uh, the, the party to um, monitor this space. And 2019, January, we got a a order uh, signed by um, the Minister of Finance saying that from now, this asset is security. And, it's, and um, it will be like this since from tomorrow. And if you are not operational now, then don't do until you get the license. And if you don't comply, you have a jail time less than 10 years. <laughs> it's written there. 
And after that, they announced quite detailed guideline. They didn't make a new guideline, so they had existing guidelines on recognized markets. So they defined the crowdfunding, P2P, and everything inside. And they added another chapter inside, at chapter 15, and defined how those secondary markets should be operated. So basically, they bring cryptos, um, the asset exchange, into one of the resign they already have. Mm -hmm. Because of that, their requirement is not that low. It's very tough. And also, they say that we have to follow this strict um, KYC ML guide guideline here. It's very detailed. So for example, like if um, like politically exposed person PEP, uh, you can do with the Malaysian PEP, but you cannot do um, the foreign uh, PEP. And if you want to do non-face to face, you need to do this, this, this. Very detailed one. And they also have this consultation paper, um, that which is uh, describing how you do ICO in Malaysia. So they are working on it. It's not final yet, but they have a clear plan to regulate ICO space in Malaysia. So at the moment, if you want to do ICO in Malaysia, you cannot. You have to wait until this uh, guideline is uh, fixed. In Thailand, um, this is the emergency, emergency decree by the king. And he said, that, oh, I noticed a lot of people like using crypto assets, but there's no law at the moment. So, but I do see there is uh, some innovative element of the blockchain or DLT, so I'm not going to stop this, but we're going to control the side effect. And they define crypto asset um, the market as like, they have uh, two buckets. One is cryptocurrencies, the other one is digital assets. Cryptocurrencies are something like um, the medium to be used to buy those digital tokens. And digital tokens, I feel like they treat it more like securities. And in market, they define those ICO portals. So if you are helping an issue to issue the digital token, you should be licensed under Thailand SEC. And then um, they define those delay broker, which is also licensed. And you can uh, the, the open up secondary market, like if you get the license under Thai SEC. And at the moment, I think they uh, issued a license, uh, I mean, provisional one to um, the, 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 the few players already. And um, they are monitoring those players, how to um, they operate their businesses. And they also have a the, the detailed uh, guideline for FIs, whether they can do or not. And, uh, and banks, they are not allowed to do any, to any like crypto businesses. But if you have a securities company, you can do ICO, you can issue a token, or you can uh, do ICO porters, helping others to issue their tokens. And you can uh, do custodian or you can do exchanges. And uh, the lastly, the Philippines, uh, they issued this guideline in 2017, January, from the bank of Central Bank of the Philippines, uh, because they have a lot of those uh, crypto remittance uh, sending money into the Philippines. And uh, with that guideline, they have a detailed like, control and the reporting obligation and sanction clause and this and that. And uh, they, um, at the moment, they issued license to seven companies in the Philippines. So if I wrap up here, each country had different idea. In Singapore, they say virtual currency. In Indonesia, they say crypto asset, which is commodity. Thailand and Malaysia is quite similar. They have a digital currency or digital token. And ICO in Singapore, Indonesia, not regulated yet. But um, Malaysia, Thailand is regulated by SC or SEC. And exchanges, all regulated here. So there, is, there isn't like unregulated exchanges. So if you want to open up exchange in those countries, you need to get a license. And they also have like who is the, um, the the authority monitoring this space. So, like I would say, last two years there was a lot of change in those countries, and they are trying very hard to um, adapt to this new innovation, which is perhaps helping their own economies. All right. Thanks, Alex. Uh, that was a very thorough. Uh, dive into uh, the regulations. Given all the different countries in Southeast Asia, I mean, that must be quite an effort to, to keep on top of all the changes in recent regulations. Uh, and and uh, my good friend Valentin has been sitting next to me for almost an hour now, <laughs> yeah. not saying a word, <laughs> almost falling asleep. But uh, uh, Valentin works for uh, the largest media company in Germany. And what is a media company doing in blockchain and securities exchange? Yeah, 
thanks for having me, Tilgu. Uh, I was not falling asleep, uh, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, maybe to provide some context first, because I think Access Springer is not yet uh, a household name here in South Korea. Um, Access Springer is the largest digital publisher in Europe. And, um, and maybe for most people in the room, it's hard to believe, but there was a world before the internet. And I'm uh, emphasizing digital publisher here because in the early 2000s, still, Access Springer had almost no revenues whatsoever from digital or online businesses. And that transformed quite, quite, quick, quite quickly recently. And today, 90% um, of our revenues are coming from digital or online businesses. And the reason why I'm mentioning this um, is um, to answer your question, what are we doing in the blockchain space as a media company? I mean, maybe you know Business Insider or eMarketer, these are some of our international brands. It's not obvious what we would do in, in the blockchain space. So the general answer there is with new technology, um, we always do it. We have a kind of a trial and error approach. So um, I personally don't believe in the concept of being a fast follower. And I think in many um, areas in our company, um, we try to lead the way. And um, blockchain um, is obviously one area that is extremely significant here. And we as a media company, we know what it's like to get our industry totally disrupted by innovation, the internet, right? Mobile and the internet totally um, changed our business models. And um, it's um, our hypothesis that um, what happened to our industry with the internet is what's happening to the financial industry with blockchain. Um, um, we all know that uh, the financial industry, um, to a large extent, still runs on infrastructure that is older than uh, the iPhone. And um, so we see an opportunity here to um, actually expand our business. And the reason for that is not just because it's a new technology, but what the technology does is it's cutting our middleman and it allows more direct to consumer business. So um, today already, um, um, we own the, uh, we run the uh, largest finance, financial news portal in Germany. So people already come to us, the financial po um, news portal, but also the other news outlets. They come to us to inform themselves about capital market and the world economy. And um, we already, um, we already um, um, operate in a, another J JV, uh, a broker business. So people, r we don't give stock recommendations, but people read about the stock market. So um, um, for a few years now, um, our, our readers can now also purchase stocks um, through our broker uh, joint venture. And that has been uh, tremendously successful. So um, that was a motivation for us to maybe to integrate a little bit deeper there. And blockchain technology is allowing us exactly to do that. So. Um, um, uh, the, the, the vision um, that, we, that we share with Börse Stuttgart um, here is that, um, and that was actually a discussion that um, Alex and I had in our first meeting um, in that regarding that topic mm -hmm. was that um, our bet is that um, much of value exchange um, will be in some s form of a token, tokenization in the future, and we don't think that these tokens will be purchased at the local bank um, in a brick and mortar shop. There's gonna be new channels where to buy and sell and purchase uh, tokens. And um, we think it makes a whole lot of sense that you can do it where you already read about, um, about um, the economy and stocks and securities and so on. And um, yeah, so that's our bet. And that's why we partner with um, with Börse Stuttgart uh, because we still a very traditional old school German company. So um, of course uh, we wanted to have a partner with all the licenses in place, uh, which is not as aggressive as money people here maybe in the room. Um, so for us, for us it's a perfect middle way to go. Yeah. Great, great. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of uh, regulations, um, I just wanted to throw out a general question to all of the panelists. Uh, for, for Korea, uh, the regulators here won't even talk to us officially. Um, I, I'm sure they're studying very hard mm. all the trends going on uh, in different parts of the world, but it's kind of a surprise because they always talk about, uh, you know, blockchain and uh, exchanges and tokenization happening in quote-unquote small countries, 
like Switzerland or Singapore, but today you see countries like Germany and Canada uh, working together with the regulators, coming up with a regulatory framework, and then actually executing and uh, allowing these different uh, securities exchanges uh, operate in, in their relative countries. Now, I'm just curious how you got to that point, how you started the process of uh, uh, getting uh, permission, getting the licenses, and working out the different rules? Yeah, um, for us it was really, as I said, we started mid of 2017. Uh, that was very new for, for the regulators and for, for the government. They saw that something would come up there, but they were not really sure. And that tremendously changed uh, actually around mid to mid to end of 18 and then especially then is uh, again 2019 so the regulators were building up teams uh, to really dig into the material and better understand the material but regulators they they're not there to regulate something that's not there it's not they're the, not the early movers they need to see something not an idea not something not tangible they need to something see something in front of them and from, a, from somebody where they have the impression that they understand the general needs of regulation. And that's something which most of the, or a lot of, let's say, startup companies miss out as they, well, they, they put the regulator in a lame and, and, well, I don't need it, and why, and so bucket, uh, instead of helping the regulator to see what really happens. Uh, so that was what we really did, is a lot of conversations a lot of showing exactly what we do, not what we think we should do, but what we are going to do, and then invite them to experience that. And that helped tremendously to bring them to a, let's say, positive demeanor, just saying, okay, guys, we listen to you, we see what you do, um, when we have a point, we come back, we ask about this, we ask about this, and so it worked better and better and better. Um, and now, naturally, with the German government ha having maybe realized that once in a lifetime they have a chance to be on the forefront of a development <laughs> and not running around, um, now that was really the final push because that was really from top government down, ruling parties, to say we have a digital agenda and in the digital agenda blockchain is mentioned several times. And so latest with that, all the ministries, let's say, fell into the direction of support and that also was a big push for all the more institutional players because they knew, okay, now it gets serious. Government is going to do it. It's not a question of when, it's, or, well, if, or, or whether at all. <coughs> it's just a question when timeliness it hits in the market. So continuous discussion, helping them to see and understanding the general needs, that was it for us. I see. How about Canada, PH? Well, I think uh, I really appreciate the positive approach of uh, Canadian Securities Commissions. So the, the official name is the CSA Canadian Securities Administrators, and that each province has a Securities Commissions. Uh, so when there was a cryptocurrency hype in the market, uh, you know, the regulator's perspective was, you know, we're just come to us and talk to us. We're not trying to crack you down. We believe this is a new, uh, you know, financing solution to technology companies. So that's our perspective. So don't be afraid of us coming, come to us and talk to us. That was the, uh, the attitude of those securities commissions. Uh, the second thing is uh, securities commissions, they have been issuing consultation paper. So they uh, identified uh, certain risks and risk mitigation strategies and asked uh, very specific questions to the uh, fintech community, uh, you know, asking is there any other risks that we are not really, we have not identified, or do you have any any uh, further comments on what we are trying to do? Mm -hmm. So there is a very active communication between the securities regulators uh, and uh, and fintech community. And furthermore, uh, you know, some of the uh, securities regulators, because of these crypto markets, they have been cooperating, uh, you know. Uh, very progressively as well, uh, such as Financial Conduct Authority of the UK, uh, Security SEC of the United States, uh, you know, CSA, Singapore, uh, MAS, uh, you know, all these regulators, I found that they know each other very well, 
They actively communicate about the development of their regulations. And in fact, they even have cross-border sandbox program. So uh, I think it's, we have been benefited from the positive uh, you know, approach of the uh, Securities Commissions of Canada. Mm. Um, and second thing is our approach was, uh, you know, instead of trying to do quietly, uh, let's just go and talk to them, you know, what we want to do. So just try to have a, that open communication at the outset. That right. has been also very helpful. I know that, uh, Alex, you've been through <laughs> quite some obstacles and challenges in Southeast Asia. Uh, is there a difference between the different uh, countries, the, the regulators, well, they have a different attitude? I will say that there is a spectrum. And um, the regardless about their spectrum, um, the our, our stance was quite the same. So the, the, the key in our stance was to uh, have transparent engagement so when when we met them those regulators they were quite surprised because they told me that um, those crypto players they they try to you know hide they don't really like just come to you first knock your door and ask questions so in in, in some countries they told me that we are the first one to knock their door and um, we had a lot of discussions with a lot of regulators um, the across the region. And um, when we had a discussion, uh, we tried to be transparent as much as we can because we are not perfect. And if we say p that we are perfect and we are ready, they got scared. They got worried about it. <laughs> so understanding that there is a missing gap between industry and regulator was a starting point. And uh, in that sense, I really appreciate um, those regulators across um, those countries, especially in Indonesia. Like for example, yesterday, um, our team spent um, time with the Babeti, which is a regulator in Indonesia, 12 hours in Bali. So they reached out to those, those crypto companies in Indonesia and told them, oh, I know that you guys also have concerns. <laughs> so they met up in Bali they spent 12 hours together wow. to understand what is concern on regulator side, on the business side. So this kind of the effort on both sides is like helping to shape this um, the scene in nice way, in a um, in, in, in great, great way. I see. Um, ha having been a journalist in a previous life, I know that um, the media has very strong ties and relationship with, with the government and uh, just curious whether uh, Axel Springer had an active role in uh, bargaining and uh, talking to the government officials in opening a, uh, a digital uh, exchange in Stuttgart. So, of yeah, there, there are strong ties there for sure, but um, I think in this particular partnership, there wasn't so much of a necessity because the colleague from Berlin Stuttgart talk um, with the authorities on a almost daily basis. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, but we, for for example, we hosted a dinner at our um, at our headquarters where we actually also mm -hmm. had lunch, mm -hmm. and we hosted a dinner and um, we, we provided the location. It was hosted by one member of the parliament and we called it the blockchain dinner and we um, invited stakeholders from the industry and um, so there were, there were a couple of members from the parliament and we were just everybody were talking issues they were having so um, we allowed conversations between the industry and um, and some of the politicians to actually happen and also um, there are all kind of working groups um, in the parliament where, where we would get invited um, as well so there is a there is um, uh, ongoing conversation and the basis for all this is that there's a big openness in the government to actually um, um, push this development and make sure that Germany becomes an um, important, important player in this development. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, moving into the discussion on, on the regulations, I think um, uh, you each have uh, touched on the, the contents of regulation in your respective presentations, but um, 
in terms of uh, opening up a uh, crypto exchange in these uh, jurisdictions, you can kind of divide them up uh, in, into different areas. First, uh, entry. Uh, wh how, how do you set up uh, uh, an exchange? Do you, do you need licenses or permissions? And then once you've set them up, what kind of conduct is required from you? And then there's also prudence where there's certain minimum requirements that you have to meet in order to, to operate. And lastly, uh, is there oversight and what, what penalties follow that? So um, in each of those areas, I'm going to start with entry. Uh, is there a, a separate body of legislation that, that requires you, you get a specific license from the government? Yeah, absolutely. So it really depends on the product that you trade. The product defines the regulatory framework. For example, uh, cryptocurrencies in Germany, they are ruled in the sense that for operating in a secondary market, you need a multilateral trading facility license, an MTF license. Now, um, the Exchange Act or the, let's say, the, the whole rule work um, and rule book around exchange traded products is very much defined in Europe. So everybody was just waiting for, okay, where in which bucket falls which product? As soon as we know in which bucket it falls, the regu regulation is standard. It's pretty defined, you can download it, it's, there's, no, there's no gray areas. For example, as soon as, as Germany said it's an MTF, everybody knows what's to, what he's going to do. Everybody knows about which license, which uh, equity capital I need, which processes are uh, coming up, uh, whether I can onboard retail clients or not, what security measures do I have to have, which reportings do I have to have. This is all standardized and we, we ju just pushed into that bucket. Now for security tokens, high likelihood that we just fall onto the e Exchange Act. So multilateral trading facilities are regulated by BaFin. Security tokens or securities are regulated by the Exchange Act and then you have a separate let's say, supervisory authorities who's responsible for you. But again, the rule book is standardized, it's clear, it's there, and there is not even, they're not changing the rule book for this new product because they just said, well, this is security, security is defined, done. It's a little bit different on, on an underlying level where you have securitization still on a paper basis, and that needs to be now a switch to digital. And this, which sounds like a little step, is actually a bi pretty big step because the whole ownership laws in Europe are based on the physical good. So in every single rule book, law book, it tailors down to a physical good. And so they have to actually change now all the rules to just ex enhanced on, on, on the digital side. But as soon as they have done that, as I said, everything is pretty much standardized and you can just follow through. Yeah. Um, interesting to see will be whether, and this is the, at last the, the ex clearly mentioned will of the German government, that in the first phase they adopt, so to say, the product to the existing range, and in the second step optimize the process based on the efficiency capabilities of the blockchain technology, and that is interesting. So if you go to the, to the post-trade world, where all of a sudden you have instantaneous trading, you have no counterparty risk, you don't need a central counterparty to clear everything there, all of a sudden you can gain huge efficiency effects, which then helps mass adoption. But the, the timely steps will be first setting up the rules, put them in the right buckets, and the third step then is to optimize the processes. So um, the government will be looking very closely at Absolutely. each and every step that, that you're Absolutely. taking. Absolutely, and you have to apply for the licenses, and as I said, the rule book for these are pretty much set for quite a long time, um, and you can just read it up, and usually to come up with a new license takes quite a while. I see. Um, a quick question popped into my mind. All would would Bose Stuttgart ever trade utility tokens? I, I think yes. I think we, we should not be the ones Currently, the finance industry defines what our customers want to trade. I think this is a wrong approach. We should make available for trading what our clients want. Mm -hmm. And if this is a, a token or a physical security 
or an ownership right or a property that has to be defined by the user. And we need to, and the for the user it doesn't make, I mean, users don't care whether this is a fully fledged exchange and MTF and OTC market. I mean, this is finance talk, nobody cares. They just want a, a good interface and they expect that everything that comes after that is stable, secure, and falling under the correct law. That's just the expectation. And this is what we want to build up. And if the, there is something as a, as a, well, let's say, utility token with a certain um, viability to trade, yes, definitely. And uh, Canada, uh, you mentioned that uh, you already got the license. You've been working closely with, with the government there. Um, is that a scheme that's uh, different from existing legislation, or have you gone through that traditional uh, uh, <coughs> approval process? Right. Uh, you know, in our case, we're not a, a since we're not creating a, a, a crypto exchange uh, to deal with the cryptocurrency or or utility tokens. Uh, we're slightly different, but uh, generally in Canada, um, you know, the or at the at the beginning, lots of crypto exchanges they just started. It's just commodity. So, uh, you know, if you follow Quadriga story, uh, you know, basically he was running an exchange on his laptop while he was traveling here and there. Um, and uh, you know, after that, I think uh, people realized that the uh, they wanted to use this FS, you know, money service MSB license. So money service business registration. Um, so which is basically FX, FX dealers use, uh, you know, and, the, um, and then they open the crypto exchanges. But with the incidents of Quadriga, uh, you know, recently uh, you know, the CSA uh, issued a consultation paper so that they can legislate, uh, you know, new uh, regulations uh, to build the crypto exchanges. So uh, we don't really have a specific guideline yet, uh, but. Again, uh, the you know the 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 requirements that I put as a marketplace is, and also as a dealer, uh, that's basically from a consultation paper of CSA. So you know you can you can expect uh, as a marketplace even for crypto exchange, you basically have gotta have all the uh, necessary um, you know tools that you you gotta have as a security exchange down the road, not now. But down the road. And, and for Southeast Asia, I, you, you had a neat uh, graph and everything was, was in, yeah, in, so in um, those boxes. L let me wrap it up, like in Southeast Asia, in um, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, we, to operate um, the exchange, you need to get a license in all countries. And those licenses are brand new licenses. It wasn't there before, but now they have that license scheme. And um, the, the, the guideline or requirement is very tough. So um, if we talk about how detailed they are, let's say you have a hot wallet and you have um, those private key inside, then you may need to slice and dice those private key into pieces and across, like save it uh, just in case you encrypt it. And they ask what kind of encryption algorithm we use. Mm. So it's, it's that detailed. And for example, in, in uh, Indonesia, uh, you need to put um, at least like more than 70% of as a holding in a separate cold wallet. And uh, among that cold wallet, more than 50%, you need to put it in third party, you know, this the asset custodian, which never exists so far. And they have a definition for th this asset custodian as well. So they are making those brand new, the, the, the world of the regulation at the moment. Mm -hmm. And talking about the cap requirement, well, in Singapore, it's quite low. Its base capital is like 250 sing, 250k sing dollar. It's not that high, but um, it's a it's a base capital. So if you are budding, you need to top up more. In uh, Malaysia, I think it's about uh, five million Malaysia ringgit. It's about 1.3 million USD. In Thailand, 50k uh, no 50 million Thai baht is about 1.6 million USD. In Indonesia, for crypto exchange, it's about um, 50 billion Indonesian rupiah, which is about 3.6 mil USD. But if you wanna um, the, the include those commodities or those tokenized commodity as well, then you need to check it up to like 36 mil USD capital. So it's uh, quite an intensive requirement there. And uh, oh, another one. yeah, I want to add something, which is interesting um, from an approach from the German regulators. 
that if you go through the full value chain, you have various licenses, like the broker license, if you want to go for retail, you have the exchange license, and then you need a full banking license, and maybe you need a clearinghouse license, and you need a payment service provider license, and whatever, what have you. Now, currently, it is the approach that you can use an existing license to enhance your, your universe of products. Mm. But this will not be true for the custodian. So in Germany ruled out, or this most likely how it will be, uh, that even if you are a full bank, you need to uh, set up a separate entity with a new, completely new banking license, and that alone can only do cryptocurrency custodians. And this is something which is pretty, I would say, uh, new, because so far they required the license on the one hand, but if you had one, that was okay. Now they say, no, 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 this is a very separate business. We need to separate the risk, and therefore you have to completely set up a new entity to that one. So regarding that, uh, let's say legacy-wise, everyone is back to square one. <coughs> we all have to apply for the new license. Even the big banks, if they want to go into that space, there's no major benefit. Okay, they have the process in place, but there's no major benefit, and the process for acquiring the license starts end of this year, so it's pretty tight. And if End you don't manage year. by, I think it's fe between February and June next year, that's it. Yeah, then you are for 2020 <laughs> will be done. So it will be pretty interesting to see who will be offering that service in Germany. That is uh, a pretty tight time schedule. Um, and also, uh, touching upon uh, these kind of conduct uh, regulations, uh, I, I briefly mentioned during my introduction that the the FATF came up, came up with these travel rules, mm. and uh, this is having uh, stirred up a lot of controversy um, in Korea, especially among uh, uh, exchanges that have been in operation for, for several years. Now, how would that, would it impact uh, your, your operations in Germany, Canada, Southeast Asia? Well, in, in uh, South Asia, I, I will say um, FEDF is guideline, and each countries, um, they in each jurisdiction, they need to make a um, regulation based on that the, the, the guideline. And um, I in Singapore, we are not seeing like any additional the regulation based on the recent um, recommendation from the FEDF. Uh, but in other country, they're working on it, as I know. But the key will be how they interpret that uh, travel rule. So if they really break down into each individual level, it will be very tough. But if they can like wrap it up to um, those, let's say, um, exchange level, then like it will be easier to implement. And in Singapore, those um, KYC email uh, thing is quite um, interesting and efficient. So since we are not a licensed entity in Singapore at the moment, because license will be commenced by uh, the, the de January of next year, so we, if we see any like suspicious trading, we had to go to police station. So we printed out all those KYC information and uh, those evidence and everything, and we go to the police station, and uh, they give us a stamp, and we got a receipt, and we keep it, and we have done our obligation. But it was like quite a, a lot of work to go in there. So we asked them, hey, why, you, why, why, can we, uh, why we cannot use the online system? They told us that oh, since you are not the licensed company yet, uh, but I told them, like, if it's easier for us to fight online, it will be better. So the, the Singapore police, they gave us access to their solar system. So now we can uh, fight online. <laughs> so, like, uh, well, uh, what I want to say is that they have, when they have regulation, they have uh, their intention. And as long as we are helping the intention, yeah. I think they are quite flexible. I would agree to that. I, I think, I mean, again, Germany is, is regarding that very introvert. Yeah? Um, in the end, uh, it, uh, it's only interested that they say, well, we don't care what's outside of Germany, we regulate Germany, or we're there for, for Germany. On the other hand, as Alex said, the regulators have pretty, pretty good ties. Yeah? And uh, I would say mm, as soon, uh, as long as we fulfill the general requirements of the region, that's okay, and then let's see what really comes on top of that one. And then most likely, if you again approach the regulator and say, hey, come on guys, how do we do it? Here it says a little bit left, here it says a little bit right, then usually you find a way for that one. But um, as said, if you apply for license in, in Europe, 
you are anyway so regulated and so ruled out, there's nearly how hardly something that you can move afterwards. Well, would that be the same for Canada? For, for so your uh, recently, uh, in terms of KYC AML, uh, in Canada, it's a uh, venture compliant to KYC AML. Uh, it's required. So basically, it's at the level of financial institutions uh, to take uh, new, uh, you know, investors uh, or clients uh, to, you know, to to an exchange. So that's uh, that's relatively new. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to open up the the panel to questions from the floor. If you have any uh, questions that you have submitted, uh, we would be more than happy to answer them. In Europe, after, after the passage of the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, there have been a lot of problems or issues that have come up in blockchain projects. Uh, uh, I would like to know the relationship between GDPR and blockchain, and if there is a problem, uh, what is the resolution? If I would have a resolution right now, I'd probably write a book about it. No, uh, kidding. Um, well, it really depends on, again, um, what do we store there. Uh, in Germany or in Europe, a lot of uh, companies are actually um, experiencing or trying to, to come up with, let's say, with protocols or formats that have, uh, like Corda R3, that have a certain, let's say, data protection. They are not totally public outside of the ones who have really the transaction, or um, especially starting for secure, on the security side, you're talking anyway over a private network, even if it is <coughs> if it is a network afterwards, it's a private one, so there, data protection is not so big of an issue. Data protection really is an issue. In this, what we see as a big benefit, that everything is on the, on the chain and everything is visible for everybody, that naturally goes against um, GDPR, this is just the fundamental issue uh, because I need to, for every moment in time, uh, I need to be the owner of my data and I, and I need to have the capability of erasing the data if I want to. Now, if everything for me stands forever on the chain, then this is the total violation of this law and this is just the way where we ha definitely have to think which protocol is useful for what, and uh, maybe you find ways that not everything is totally transparent, and that would be the way. Uh, if we can't erase it afterwards, which would be a little bit against the whole principle of having it documented forever, but maybe not everything needs to be totally transparent to everybody, and that should be a way around that. But it's very early on, so I cannot really answer what the ultimate um, resolution will be. Um, by the way, do I have to be a German national or an EU national to be able to trade on your platform? Today, you uh, at this point in time, you, you would need a Euro con um, account. Um, we'll open up that uh, for other currencies and also other regions. But today, yes, you would have to have a Europe account. I In see. Europe, but a Euro account. Thank you. <coughs> uh, question to DH. Uh, Uh, would the would the stock market uh, play a role in uh, uh, evaluating in in uh, escalating the price of uh, coins, digital currency? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, why? Because uh, these cryptocurrency uh, tokens are, you know, we we say they are not securities. Um, and their utilities, but let's look at it carefully. You know, all these cryptocurrencies and uh, tokens, uh, do we really see a strong utility out of it? Probably not yet, but essentially we are buying, uh, you, know, in, you know, people are buying these cryptocurrencies and tokens because, because they believe, you know, the value is gonna go up. So the motive, the, uh, the motive and, 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 and the incentive uh, behind uh, investors, uh, you know, purchase of these cryptocurrencies and tokens are essentially the same. 
it, it's, a, it's a value gain, right, and the price gain. And, and therefore, uh, you know, there, there is, uh, I think, a strong correlation between uh, securities market and cryptocurrency market. And in fact, uh, I, I don't re I'm not really sure. I think one day some of the uh, business professors were, would study uh, the correlation of uh, Bitcoin prices and the, uh, you know, the stock market indexes, how they perform each other. But it looks like there's a, some sort of correlation, uh, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah. And, and at the same time, uh, even the Bitcoin market, uh, you know, it's there. Uh, and I'm not really sure the Bitcoin price sustains and, and goes up uh, because of the fundamental value of the network or uh, so much capital already uh, flew into the Bitcoin market. Okay, next question. Uh, this one is for Alex Kim. It seems that the uh, uh, speed of uh, uh, regulation is especially fast in Southeast Asia regarding blockchain and cryptocurrency. Uh, what is the major reason mm. for this? Right, I think this is a very good question. And I do agree that um, it's faster in Southeast Asia on those, um, the, the reaction from the government side on this crypto space. Now I think that the reason is, the first, um, I think those, those biggest the enemy of innovation is actually laziness. People are lazy, they don't want to change. So to make them to change, you need to give them a value proposition. And they perceive value compared to the, the legacy service they use. So the, the better your service is, the high value you deliver. And um, if you're able like, not properly working on legacy service, then your service is better. And um, in many countries in South Asia, the legacy is not that good. Like, if you want to send money, then they will like do a batch process three times a day, and you need to pay a lot of fees. And the weekend you cannot send the money. And um, like, if you want to invest in a company, it's very tough. Like, for example, in Indonesia, the population um, investing in crypto asset is three times higher than the people investing in stock market. So. If you look at this, then uh, you will realize that those those like promises coming from the crypto services looks very fancy in those countries, and those Southeast Asian companies, well, they saw what could be done by online or mobile. Now they have a Grab, they have a Gojek in Indonesia, and they understand what could be changed by new technology. So they want to boost those innovations. Government, they want to promote this. So because of all those things, I think the South Asia is moving ahead of you know, many um, more developed countries. I think, I think it's also, if I may add to that, um, if you look for global financial markets, the markets are pretty much well distributed. In a sense, you have a hand, let's say two, three handful of very powerful players in that market. You have a bunch of countries very powerful in that market. And what we have here has the potential to tip that power level in a different direction. Um, and this also, f especially for smaller countries, for smaller companies, uh, to, to gain back a little bit of this ground that they lost over time to maybe this over powerful players. And this is a chance when you move fast and, and set up rules so that you can follow them. That's a chance that you can follow up. And it's not often that you have the chance to tip a little bit the power balance. Uh, next question is for all of us. Um, token e economy is a market where uh, liquidity is maximized by, by the global market. Uh, in case of security tokens, each country has uh, different regulations. Uh, we have uh, stock type, uh, real estate type, bond type, project funding type, and if all these different types have different regulations, uh, would, wouldn't that be a barrier to global liquidity? 
I would say no. Um, yes, there are, there are differences, for example, if you have stocks or certificates or derivatives or commodities, but as soon as you put something in the general securities bucket, then there is a pretty high match of the general rules. But correct me, the, the differences come also from aspects of um, which investors need to have what information before they can trade, can they trade directly, data protection is differently. So there's a lot of laws around the classical product, let's say, that can differ tremendously. But the stock market, a stock in Thailand, is not so much different regulated than a stock in Germany in itself. Yeah? Commodity is then totally different to a stock. But again, a commodity in Thailand is not totally out of space to a commodity in Germany. So this is really something where you would have to really put both rule books next to, next to each other and then discuss with both regulators, hey guys, come on, if we tick that box and that box, can we do it? And most of the times you find a way around this. The global trading was mainly hindered so far by big post-trade organizations who have monopoly structures and that made it very inefficient to trade there. It was less because of the ruling of the product in itself, but correct me. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree on that and I totally agree that liquidity should be the king, liquidity is authority in um, the capital market. And if we, well, when you talk about security, um, the token, like there should be something better by doing tokenization. And that's something good should be um, both um, good on the token issuer side and investor side. Well, everyone needs money. So getting token issuer, not that tough. Well, if we can make the issuing token easier with token, then it will, it will be beneficial to them. And if we can make investing in security easier, I mean, especially on the cross-border investors, because we use token, then it's a good thing. Um, so, like, existing security market is highly fragmented, as, as we discussed uh, yesterday. Then that's, that's scattered, and liquidity is like killing the market. But um, tokenization, uh, in general, I believe that it is um, the helping to um, the add up those liquidity, which is um, the beneficial thing to the market. Uh, I completely agree with, you know, two Alexis here. <laughs> uh, just adding a couple of things. Actually, this is the value that, uh, it's a, val a strong value proposition of uh, uh, blockchain capital market solution uh, because it's, it's a program of securities. So uh, if there's a slight differences in different jurisdictions, we can even program them and, pre you know, uh, uh, provide uh, preventive compliance solution to the market. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, you know, think about it. It's not really a huge uh, problem. Uh, let's say BMW sell BMW in EU market and also in Japan, UK, Korea, North America, but every country they have a different environmental regulation, in fact. And some countries, they drive on the right side, on the left side, and you gotta adjust your product to that. Uh, in capital markets, it's about issuer. That's one dimension. Second is, where is the investor? That's a second dimension. And the third dimension is, where is the marketplace? So it's not a, a, it's not a huge mountain. It's only three dimensions that we have to deal with. We're not talking about uh, five or seven dimensions here. So I think it's, it's a doable. But the liquidity part is always difficult. And the liquidity is also involved with information. Uh, I think the issue will be a lot of these security tokens, uh, possibly the securities of non-reporting issuers, which will provide a lot less information to investors. Yeah. With that, can you really have a good liquidity? That's a question mark. Okay. Um, before we go into the next question, I had a personal question um, that popped into my mind. Uh, if each of you could uh, uh, give a brief explanation about the usefulness of categorizing tokens or coins into security tokens and utility tokens, uh, especially in the mind of the regulator, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that draws a very clean line between whether one 
agency has jurisdiction over the, the other. And so a lot of uh, regulators are, are thinking in, in that sense and, and looking at uh, different projects and coins and thinking whether this is a security token or a utility token. Uh, would that make sense for you? Practically, um, the distinction was important for us because, um, as Alex mentioned before, you are in almost no country, you as a retail customer are allowed to trade directly at a securities exchange. You have to go through a broker. And um, in the case of uh, cryptocurrencies or of tokens, which are not a security token, um, there is um, which we call an exemption or a loophole, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> um, but here, um, uh, retail investors can trade directly at the exchange and don't have to go through a broker, which for us from a business standpoint was very important um, for our overall strategy. So here it's an important distinction. And uh, for me, the, the distinction makes sense to lower the barrier of entry. So because I think if you wouldn't have that uh, distinction in the first place then or at all, then um, the strongest regulation, the toughest regulation would apply and that would um, stifle a lot of innovation in that space. So to have that other um, category of um, token where you can um, move faster um, is helpful um, uh, because then you have less regulation there. Yeah. I totally agree. I think it's, it's correct to have a distinction there. Um, a, a lot of regulators go down the route of uh, you have a currency token, you have a utility token, and you have a security token. Let's see what really ends up being in the utility side, because at least in Germany it seems that the regulators are pretty much pushing it left or right, and very little may be ending up in the middle. But it's exactly like Valentin said. Um, if we wouldn't have that, that distinguish, it will probably all be pushed toward the highest regulated bucket, and then we would overrule some of the aspects that can be used very, very efficiently and very fastly. And uh, this is also true for existing products. And not every security is totally regulated the same. There's a, a certain level which applies to everything. But then can come specialties depending on who's playing with this or who's working with this, who's trading, who's fulfilling which role. And I think this is correct when we transport that to the next level. Yeah, I think it is important to have that distinction uh, for the platform operator well, if it's a decentralized platform, it's really platform users and uh, also for regulators. Uh, you know, let's say stock X. Uh, if you buy shoes paying $2,000, uh, you know, a pair of shoes at stock X, uh, you know, you buy because you believe the value of the, you know, this pair of shoes is $2,000. And at least you have that pleasure of wearing that you know, pair of shoes or keeping that pair of shoes on, on, the, on your desk. So, you know, you are protected anyway, right? So if you buy gold paying, you know, $1,500 an ounce, uh, you are protected, you have your gold. Mm -hmm. But if you buy securities, well, securities can go up and down. And you don't know the value unless, you know, you don't have good information. Now there, I just said information, and that's why uh, these public companies, they have continuous disclosure requirements, which is very expensive, uh, you know, mandatory requirements. Uh, but if you're a utility token, you don't have to do that because you basically provide a good use of your tokens to, to the people. Mm. In, in my view, like, I, I could be wrong, but I, I feel like the uh, security token uh, have a lot of prospect for the development in the future because basically we want to make money. I mean, by others' effort. <laughs> that is security. <laughs> so I in that sense, and uh, since uh, there's a lot of regulations uh, around the securities, security tokens, uh, I should say, um, is kind of untapped, I would say. And since like those mainstream, um, those FIs are participating in this scene, they will try like using the blockchain or DLT, uh, securitizing those assets. So, like since securities, security tokens are starting from zero in some way, I will see like more uh, development on security token side. Okay, um, I'm gonna uh, make this the last question, and this question is for Alex. Uh, I've heard that in Singapore, 
uh, regulations are kind of relaxed in the form of a sandbox regulation. And the Singapore Stock Exchange has uh, uh, directly invested into security token exchange uh, and, it's in, and it's in the process of uh, launching. Uh, and uh, I've heard that it will open in December of this year. And now, uh, does uh, Upbit have any plans to enter the security token exchange business in Southeast Asia? So uh, this is the, the company we discussed um, previously. Um, so like, if you step back, um, Singapore, they survive by inviting companies to Singapore. So for them, uh, having good companies listed on SGX is quite important. But nowadays, they are delisting because of the value of the listing is like not that high at the moment. So they want to do something. Blockchain or DLT could be um, their opportunity. So they are exploring this opportunity with small experiment, so to speak. So this company got the license under MAS, I mean Sandbox 1, um, that is RMO tier 2. And RMO means like recognized market operator. So you can um, operate secondary market uh, for the securities. And for um, the token issuer, the, the benefit, you they don't need to do prospectus. It's a lot of um, like the, the, the improvement for against the tra tra traditional way. And for the investor side, uh, since there is no prospectus, there's higher risk. So you cannot reach out to those, those retail investors, but you can reach out to AIs or the <coughs> institutional. So they are playing in, in that um, the, 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 the segment at the moment. We think this is very interesting because Singapore is globally recognized capital market and uh, they, are, they mean the MAS are well the, the, the recognized of the regulator as well. And we have a lot of interesting project nearby Singapore who may want to issue a token, I mean security one in Singapore. So since Upbit has expertise in operating a utility token ex exchange, I think this is a very interesting topic for us as well. So I would say that we are looking at this space with great interest. So that's, that's a yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, we have about 12 minutes left, and I'd like to use that time for our uh, panelists to each uh, talk, have about three minutes to uh, 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 have the last uh, comments about uh, regulations in their respective jurisdictions. So starting with Valentin. Yeah, so uh, perhaps the least qualified to talk in depth <laughs> here on stage about it. I'm fully aware of that. <laughs> um, being a libertarian by heart, of course, uh, it's hard for me to talk about regulation in the first place. Um, but um, I must admit, um, even coming from that uh, um, school of thought, um, the more um, I, ha I had quite some frustration with uh, with um, dealing with all the regulatory ish, um, um, topics. But I, uh, the more you learn about them, I mean, you also understand uh, the reason behind it. It's not a job creation program for the government, um, and. Um, must say I was also surprised to deal with some really, really smart people in th at the um, um, supervi supervision authorities. So um, um, my last word, I guess, would, would be I really hope um, that we can um, really become a, um, uh, become a leader also in regulation in Germany. Um, because also, I'm um, not sure whether people are so aware of that, that the Korean and the German um, law system are not very similar, I mean, you're a lawyer. Um, and um, so the Korean government is also looking, um, I thought it's also looking to what's happening in Germany and uh, many things actually swap over to Korea. So um, if you're frustrated about how um, the regulatory environment is right now here in Korea, um, there's hope because uh, some other good things uh, already came over from Germany in the legal system to Korea. So um, yeah, maybe there's more coming soon. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking forward, um, especially on the regulation side, because I've never experienced so far this openness. Um, and we have a chance to really, let's say, restructure fundamentals of global financial markets. 
uh, and we will see a lot of new products hitting the market, products that, have, that will be deemed securities, uh, but not in the classical sense, what the regulator would put it in the bucket. Uh, so for me, it's really the once-in-a-lifetime chance to participate in something and having the openness on the other side, because we have seen such developments in the past, but then there was a strict no-change no rule from the regulator. And today we see that the regulators are really making up their mind with an open mindset uh, and on an international basis. And this is really something where we need to be now uh, persistent and go forward and take them along. And then I think we can really um, achieve a lot together with them. Mm. Okay. Uh, I think, I, you know, today I talked about relevance of technology, but I think uh, down the road uh, with the regulators, my work will be more involved with the um, discussing relevance of existing regulations uh, to, you know, uh, based on the uh, new technologies. So then the interpretation of the existing regulations and or uh, legislations uh, should be different since the technology provides a different uh, uh, solution or completely getting rid of the risks that we have in the legacy system. So I think that will be the big chunk of work that, uh, that can be done uh, with the uh, uh, Canadian regulators or some other regulators around the world. Mm. Well, I would say like if, like in some countries, there isn't any regulation at the moment. So if, if we ask, should, do we need a regulation? Yes, we need, because we have only two choices leave it as unregulated market, or we're going to regulate. So we have to regulate anyway. And the question will be how we're going to regulate. And at the moment, I, I will say, like, this new thing, DLT or blockchain is, um, the, like, live animal. It's moving fast. And we don't know where it goes, how big it will be. So regulators or any regulations, if it's too tight, it may not be applicable, then it may not achieve what it intended. So I wish regulation should be there to shape this innovation into a right way, but still it should be flexible enough to give some space for try and error. In that sense, uh, we can grow this space even um, better way. So maybe in 10 years, in 20 years, the global financial center might not be New York, it could be Stuttgart, <laughs> it could be <laughs> Vancouver, Canada, or, or Singapore. W yes. Would you agree? It could be Jakarta, though. <laughs> or, or, exactly. or the moon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, with that, I think we're all out of time, and I would like to uh, thank our distinguished panelists. Thank you very much. Please give them a big round of applause. And, and thank you all very much for uh, sticking around until the end. Thank you. Thank you. 네, 디지털 자산 시장과 그 규제 환경 변화에 대해 알아볼 수 있는 유익한 시간이었습니다. 좋은 시간 만들어 주신 이서구 대표님과 그리고 패널 네 분께 다시 한번 큰 박수 부탁드립니다.